It gives me great pleasure now to introduce the co-founder of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute for Civil Rights and Education at the Asian Law Caucus. She's the daughter of Fred and Catherine Korematsu. Please give a warm welcome to Karen Korematsu. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I hope you don't mind if I take a personal moment. Daddy, I know you're with us. Look down, see all these people that have come to honor and celebrate you. Happy birthday. On behalf of my family, I want to thank all of you for coming here today and participating in this inaugural Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution. At this time, I would like to acknowledge my mother, Catherine, who was married to my father for 58 and a half years and his greatest supporter, and my brother, Ken, but more about him later. Also, I'd like to recognize um, our, our spouses, my husband, Donald Hay, and my sister-in-law, Cece Korematsu, who will allow my brother and I to go on in social justice. Would you all please stand? I am happy to say we also have a very special friend of my father's with us today, Mr. Walt Herman. He and my father were friends for over 70 years, starting from their days together at Castlemont High School. Walt will be 92 years old this year, the same as my father if he had lived. Walt. I want to tell you my version of the Fred Korematsu story as it is paved with other heroes along the way. The first hero was in 1942. Mr. Ernest Besick, Executive Director of the Northern California Affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union. Even though Mr. Besick was threatened with ouster from the ACLU National Headquarters, he recruited attorney Wayne Collins, and the rest is history. The next was Professor Peter Irons, who in 1982 came to my father's house armed with the evidence that showed the Justice Department had lied to the U.S. Supreme Court at the time of my father's case in 1944. The next group of heroes is the Quorum Nobis legal team, who in 1983, as my mother always points out, worked pro bono and put their young legal careers on the line and took the risk of possibly losing Korematsu versus the U.S. all over again. Let me introduce them to you and please hold your applause until I finish. Unfortunately, Peter Irons, Eric Yamamoto, and Leanne Miyasato could not be with us today. So first we have Lead Counsel Dale Manami, U.S. Magistrate Judge Ed Chen, Superior Court Judge Dennis Hayashi, Attorneys Don Tamaki, Lori Bonai, Karen Kai, Bob Rusky, Margie Barrows. Please stand and be recognized. They deserve it. Our next hero was Judge Marilyn Hall Patel, Northern California District Federal Court, who overturned my father's conviction in 1983. She warned in her decision, and I quote, that in times of war or declared military necessity, our institutions must be vigilant in protecting constitutional guarantees. The legal team told us in 1983 that the third part of the case would be education win or lose. They took that to heart and crisscrossed the U.S. with my father, telling his story and helping him fulfill his mission of education. As you know, several awards were given to my father, who received them also on behalf of the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated. 
the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the California State Senate Medal, and the Rainbow Push Coalition Advocate, Advocate, Advocacy Award presented to my father by Reverend Jackson in 1999. And thank you, Reverend Jackson, for being here today, as you too are a champion of civil rights. It is difficult to believe that by the end of March, it will have been six years since my father has passed away. In that amount of time, there have been three public schools named after him, the Fred T. Korematsu Center for Law and Equality at Seattle University of School of Law was launched in 2009. And one of my father's legal team members is the associate director of the center, Lori Bonai. In 2009, I co-founded the Asian Law, with the Asian Law Caucus, the Korematsu Institute, to help carry on the civil rights and education mission that meant so much to my father. And that brings us to today. Thank you, Assembly Mayor members Warren Fuatani and Marty Block for authoring the bill to establish this day, as well as the many co-sponsors that signed on in support. I know you all worked very hard, and you showed that when government works together, success can be achieved in a short period of time. In this case, only seven months. A sincere thank you to Ling Liu, our first director of the Korematsu Institute, who really didn't know what she was getting into when she first started this job, barely a year ago. Fred Korematsu Day was an unknown, and she had to hit the floor running. You have to realize that the Fred Korematsu Day bill was only signed by the governor on September 3rd, 2009, and we only had three months to put together curriculum. Lean will speak to you about that a little bit later. Also, thank you to Evan Goldberg, our education manager, and our fabulous interns who worked so hard on this curriculum and in, pre in preparation of this day. Also, I'd like to thank the many volunteers who have been working today and helping to, to create such a wonderful and memorable celebration. Last but not least, special thanks to our Korematsu Institute Steering Committee for their support and vision. Thank you to the Founding Circle member, members, corporate and law firm donors, foundation donors, organi organizational co-sponsors, and media sponsors for Fred Korematsu Day. It is sad that my father never lived to see this day. However, I know he would be very proud and happy that his mission of education continues. Thank you all for helping to carry on my father's legacy, an American civil rights hero who stood up for our civil liberties and the Constitution for all Americans. Thank you. Next, we have a teaser for you, a two-minute trailer of Civil Wrongs and Rights the Fred Cormonson story. At 4 p.m. today in this auditorium, we are showing the complete documentary in 35 millimeter film, which is very special because it'll be very clear and crisp. This documentary was truly a labor of love and it took over 11 years to make. It premiered in 2001 and received two Emmys, one for best director and the, one, and the other for best editing. Today we have with us the director, Eric Paul Fournier, co-producer Shirley Nakao, and last but not least, my brother and co-producer Ken Korematsu, who gave the documentary its title. Would you all please stand and be recognized? <laughs> and as they say in Hollywood, roll it.
and then uh, later on, uh, they changed my drive card to 4C, which is enemy alien. Those days, you know, Asian people automatically think you don't belong in this country. You're not an American. And, and, and I thought that was wrong. After I was arrested, and I went there and I lied on the cot and I said, gee, jail was a lot better than this. In 1942, an ordinary American took an extraordinary stand. Fred Korematsu boldly opposed the forced internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. After being convicted for failing to report for relocation, Mr. Korematsu took his case all the way to the Supreme Court. The High Court ruled against him. Fred Korematsu's case represented the trial that Japanese Americans never had. This was the entire population that without evidence, without trial, without due process of any kind, were simply swept into uh, internment camps, um, many losing their property, um, some even losing their lives. The real significance of Fred's case is that it raised, for the first time, the central issue. Was the internment itself constitutional? It was, I think for him, a personal shock of recognition. Who am I? Am I an American? What does it mean for me to be an American? If you look at a Fred Korematsu, you see a very ordinary man uh, who just wanted to be left alone, but who defied the United States government because he knew it was wrong. Some names of ordinary citizens stand for millions of souls. Plessy, Brown, Parks. To that distinguished list, today we add the name of Fred Ormonson.